Well, we have a treat tonight. I, uh, on Mother's Day and on Father's Day, I always ask uh, one of the young men in our church called to preach whose mother or father will be in the attendance to preach, to have my pulpit. This young man has uh, grown up at Lighthouse Baptist Church. He is uh, a, a very special part of our ministry. I think he was born about two or three years after I got here, something like that. Amen. And uh, just as a little bitty baby, I remember holding him and looking at him thinking, boy, what's this guy going to be about, you know? You know, you, you do that? Do you do that? I do that. You hold a little baby and you think about, what, what does God have for this child? And what's God going to do with his life? And I remember praying over him, thinking about him, and praying for him all through his years, all through the years, mentioning his name before the throne hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. Uh, let's see, hundreds and hundreds. And, yeah, that's about right, about hundreds. <laughs> and praying for him uh, all the time and watching him grow up and now he's gone off to bible college and uh he's just about done i think you finished up friday okay amen okay so he's coming all pumped he's he knows everything now he's been to three years or four years of bible college he's got a he knows everything there is to know and uh, that's what we all feel when we first get our diploma right how many of you have had a you've gone through school you got a diploma well, if you were like me, you got your diploma and you said, good night, I paid that much for this? I don't know. I, anyway, that's not true. But I, I praise God for this young man. Uh, I can tell you many other stories about his. Uh, I was dad one time, went by his room and peeked in, and Nathan was in there on his knees before God with his hands raised up praying for a revival. Amen. Uh, that image has kind of burned itself in my mind, and I, I thank God for that. I'm glad he's got a heart for that. He has a heart for missions. He wants to go and and be used of God to stir revival in Europe. You, you can't think of a more difficult field than that. Good night, that's almost like saying, I'm gonna to go to the middle of China and start a church. Uh, in terms of the resistance to the gospel, it might even be worse. Uh, if you could preach the gospel freely in China, you'd probably find a lot of, a lot of, a lot of good positive response, but boy, I tell you, Europe is cold, it's dead to the gospel right now. I remember when I visited uh, London and uh, stood across the street from Metropolitan Tabernacle. Uh, what a sadness came over me as I looked at that once great, great, great church. It's still a, a good church. The pastor's there's a good man, and the gospel's being preached. But I tell you what, it's, it's nothing compared to what it was when Spurgeon was there. And uh, it just saddened me to see how, how dilapidated it looked to me, how it all closed up. and It was just it's sad. But it's, it is indicative of the response of the people in Europe to the gospel all across the land. So we need revival in America, amen? As young men like this, I think God will use to stir it up. Brother Nathan, come on up. I appreciate you. He's gonna, we, we trust real soon, come on formally on the, on the staff here at Lighthouse Baptist Church. Might start part-time, working to full-time, might start full-time and, and then go on straight from there. We're not sure how we're gonna be able to do it, but we wanna put him on staff, amen? All right, God bless you, Brother Nathan. Come preach. Amen. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, thank you, Pastor, for this opportunity. Um, can everyone hear me? Is my mic on? Yeah. Right? Good. Uh, thank you. Um, I do not have a Mother's Day sermon prepared. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mom. I <laughs> failed you as a son. Um, but I'm assuming that I'll be next year as well, so I'll have one prepared next year. But this one was uh, the sermon... Uh, that God has laid upon my heart and has actually convicted me so strongly about, um, was inspired by my mom, and uh, she called me one day and, and talked to me on the phone and actually kind of scolded me a little. <laughs> and uh, you know what? God convicted me from that, and just through reading my Bible and getting to God's Word, the Lord really just worked something in my heart, and He tell you what, He worked me over and over, and, and you can even call my, you can ask my fiance, Marin, and there was times where I actually started crying on the phone, talking to her and just telling her, you know, this is what God's doing in my heart. And I just feel so convicted about this. And I, I don't know what to do, but I'm just so strongly convicted about this, about this, the subject that God has laid upon my heart. And so that's why I believe God would have me to preach to you tonight. And so that's why I'm going to preach to you tonight. If you would, uh, go ahead and turn over to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11. We're going to start there. First verse, I'll turn over there with you. But Hebrews 11. Hebrews.
Hebrews 11, and we'll start at verse 1 and just read a few of uh, the verses here, and we'll come back to it some more. But it says, oh, oops, I'm in Hebrews chapter 1. One second, let me get into the same place as you. Hebrews chapter 11, here we go. Verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are, which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And so we see this chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, and we so uh, commonly refer to it as the hall of faith. And I don't know about you, but as I read through Hebrews chapter 11, and it talks about Enoch and, and uh, Moses and Sarah and Abraham, I like to um, imagine myself in that position, in the position uh, of these great people, and think about, you know, what would I do? And, and often, you know, as you, as you do, and as I so often do, I always think of myself as doing exactly what they would have done, but better, right? Oh, we do that because we're human, and, and we're like, oh, I would have made the same mistake as that. Man, I would have had faith in God and just trusted. I would, Jonah, psh, I wouldn't have ran. I wouldn't have ran away. I would have gone to Nineveh, and I would let him have it, man, and I would preach, you know? And we would try to put ourselves in these positions, and we think, oh, yeah, this great faith, and I'll, I'll have this great faith. But then when, when things come and our faith is tested, it's, it's a different story. It's an entirely different story because now it's, it's on us and that responsibility, the weight is upon us and we have to think about our future lives and about those around us and our families. And, you know, I've been thinking about, about that. I'll be getting married here in June and thinking about my family and exactly the kind of man that I want to be for my family. And as I was reading through uh, Hebrews here, you know, I, I decided I want to be a man of faith. A man who has faith in God, no matter what circumstances. That the circumstances of my life will not dictate the faith I have in my God. And it's, that's a lot easier said than it is done. And uh, I think about the time that we're in right now, and even this time we're, we're kind of having our faith stretched a bit, right? Uh, whether or not we should be here um, assembled and, and come to church, or whether we should stay home and, and watch on live stream. And it's kind of, it, there's different opinions to this, and, and our faiths are being stretched. And as I'm looking at this, uh, this whole situation, and they sent me home from Bible college, and I'm just kind of watching how people respond and how things are, how men in my life are responding, and there's different men in my life who have responded different ways to this, and I just looking at it, I'm like, wondering, just, man, what do I do? How, which side is the, is the faithful man on? I was, that's, what I, that's what I want to be. I just want to be a faithful man. And I'm just looking at this and this whole situation, and I'm thinking about Hebrews chapter 11, and, and it says later on in the chapter, if you go later on, it says, uh, uh, the many heroes of faith in, in verse 32, it says, and what shall I more say? Uh, for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of, of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah and of David also and Samuel and of the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong and waxed valiant in fight, turned to the flight the armies of the aliens, Women received the dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured and escaping deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And I was reading this, I'm like, man, that's exactly what I want to be. I want to be that man of faith who, who seduces kingdoms and, and who stands up and who will take out a sword when the, when the wicked come and he's swinging his sword and, and he gains that victory from God. I'm like, that's awesome. And I, you can look back and see these heroes of faith and... But then I also remember that, wait a second, there's, there's more to it than that. It doesn't stop there. And it says, And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, 
They were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, these all having tamed a good report through faith, received not the promise. Man of faith, uh, as I was reading, is, is more than just taking up the sword and going and getting the victory. It, it's the but if nots. Remember that time when, uh, when uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were told that if they do not bow to the government, to the government at that time, and, and submit, and, and if they choose to worship God, they're going to be thrown into a furnace. And they told them, they said, our God's going to deliver us, but if not, we will serve the Lord. And so I was reminded that there's a but if not in the Bible. And the man of faith, he, he has that on his heart, the but if not. And I was thinking about this time that we're in and, and, and the struggles that we go through. And I was thinking about it. I'm like, man, we've got it easy. Like, like really? People being torn asunder. Men and women were committed to... The Colosseums where lions and tigers would come and, and kill them and eat them alive there. Their, their children and women with them. I, pe- the church would have to meet in, in secret hiding. And, and if they were found, they, they cost them their lives. But not just in the Bible. People have been going through hard times throughout man's history because of sin. And, and I believe Pastor mentioned it before in his last message. Um, the whole, uh, they have this, this article online that, um, was kind of comparing to our generation through the past generation, like if you're born in the 1900s. And so I looked it up, and I was reading it, and I was like, man, we don't know struggle. We don't know pain. Our faith hasn't been tested. If, if you will, just imagine with me that you're born in the 1900s. You're a Christian who was born in the 1900s, and you grew up your life, and everything's great, Right? It's hunky-dory, and you're there with your parents, and you're living in their house, and, and you turn 14 years, of old, 14 years old. Now you're 14, and World War I has begun. And during this time, I believe you have a picture of that. During this time of World War I, it continues on until your 18th birthday, and 75 million people die through this war. And maybe your dad gets enlisted. Uh, and he has to go to war, and maybe you never see him again, and that's it. But you have to keep going. You keep living, and you know what? You just trust God, and you keep going to church. Well, later on in that year, uh, now you're 18, the war's over, but later on in the year, the, the Spanish, Spanish flu hits. And the Spanish flu comes into the world, and it continues to run until your 20th birthday, and during that time, those two years, 50 million people die from the Spanish flu. But you survive, and you keep going. Well, you live on until your 29th birthday. And now you're a man, and you have a family, perhaps. And, or maybe you're, you're a mother, and you have your family here, and you make it to your 29 years old, and, and, and the Great Depression hits. And now you're going through the Great Depression. And the economy collapses, and the country's on the brink of collapse, and you don't know how you're going to make ends meet. You, you can't work, and you're just going along, and you have to have faith in God. So you, you survive it. You make it through, and it, it runs until you're about 33 years old. And, well, there's some time of peace for a while, and things are trying to get back, and you're trying to pick things up again. And you turn 39. And you turn 39, and World War II breaks out. And man, all, all the memories and the horrors of the past start coming back up again. The time when you're 14 and you remember your dad having to go off to war. And now it's your turn to step up. And you're just praying that, Lord God, please save America from this. Don't let America have to enter this end. Let it just end, God, and, and be done with. But by your 41st birthday... America is fully into the war. And now you go through World War II, and 75 million people 
or not 75, sorry, 22 million people perish in this war. Maybe your friends that grew up with you, maybe family members, but you have to keep going. And it doesn't stop there. No, it keeps going. At the age of 50, you go, to the, go through the Korean War. Five million people perished during the Korean War. At the age of 55, the Vietnam War picks up, and it will continue on until, for another 20 years, and four million people will perish and lose their lives in this conflict. And then here we are today, and we say we struggle. We say we have hard times. You know, these, for these men, for these Christian men and women during these times who kept going, you've got to wonder, how did they do it? How did they keep going? How did they trade their fear for faith and they just kept going? It's almost as if they had something, some kind of secret, and that they would hold to it with their lives. Something that was so precious to them. It was more dear to them than their own life. Than their own life. They were willing that the world would hate and rebuke their name. They were willing to ruin their testimony for it. They were willing to be mocked and scourged. They were willing to die, and they were willing to let their family die for it as well. These people had faith. They had faith in an almighty God, and they knew something. They knew his promises were true. In Philippians 1, verse 21, it says, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But what things were gained to me, though as I counted lost for Christ. Philippians 3, verse 8 says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of, Jesus, of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. See, I believe that these past men and women, the Christians of the faith, they knew something and they knew that through faith God would deliver them. They knew that their reward wasn't here on earth, but it was in heaven and nothing could touch it. And because they knew nothing can touch it, they were willing to risk their lives for it. Christ was real to them. He was real. And you know what? This is what really just convicted me. And this is when I started getting emotional with, with my fiance. Was I told her, I'm like, Christ is real to me. He died for me, Marin. I was telling her, Marin, he died for me. He came to this earth to where we are, and he, he humbled himself. Can you believe that he would humble himself to be with us? To, to be here on this earth? To be, he was Christ. He was God. The God of heaven. And he came down to a bunch of filthy, murdering sinners. And he made himself one of us. And he graced the dust with his feet. And he became man for us. And not only that, but he took that cross up and he allowed us to nail him to the cross and he died for our sins. He took the sins of the world, all the wickedness that we've ever done, and he put them upon himself and he gave his life for us. And I just broke down. I couldn't take it. And I was just, I just, thank you, God. <laughs> that's so real. And I, I think that that's how, that's how these men and women of the faith did it is Christ was real to them. He was real, and they knew him personally, and they knew what he did for them, and it broke them to the point where they didn't care about anything else, but they knew that they had to serve God and God alone, and so they were willing to risk their lives. They were willing to go through these horrible, horrible times through all these trials, and their faith was stretched and it was pulled, but they kept going and they kept having faith in God because they knew. They knew Christ personally. And it, it, it breaks my heart, and I'm trying to be careful here, and I don't want to I mean to offend anybody, but that's what preaching kind of does. It, it offends. Christ offends. And I'm sorry. 
but not really. <laughs> but this is my own personal conviction about this, is that if, if God is willing to send his son here with us, and he's willing to let him die so that we can come here today in this church and we can worship him, then I cannot stand idly by and just let man shut this church down. I can't. I can't do it, folks. I have to be here, and I have to serve God. Because, you know what, God, I, I trust that God in his infinite wisdom and in his knowledge, that he knew what was coming, and he knew that there would be times of trials in our faith, and he knew that diseases and wars would come. And through all this, he said, forsake not the assembly of God. And that's what I'm convicted about. And I'm telling you, I, God just got a hold of my heart. And, and you can ask my mom. I, at the beginning, I was kind of leaning about this whole thing. About, oh, maybe we should just kind of, you know, just, just obey the government right now and, and, and let them, and just let them do what they're going to do. And, and we'll all kind of blow over. And my mom's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> but Nathan, I taught you better than that. Come on. And, and she kind of scolded me. And, you know, it got me rethinking. And it, it, I... As I was thinking, I'm like, you know, Lord never says uh, when it would be a good time to close down his church. In fact, Christ died for it. And, you know, if Christ was willing to die for it, who am I? You know, who am I not to die for it too? Who cares? If, you, you don't think God knows that this world already hates him? They already hate the name of Jesus. They already hate it. So if you want to ridicule me and call me names because I want to come in here and worship Christ, then you can ridicule me. You call me all the names you want. I'm going to worship Christ. And that's my personal conviction about this. And if, you, if you're different and you, and you vary and you think you should stay home, then you know what? God bless you. And, and that's not what I'm trying to do is trying to convince you that you should be in church. What I'm trying to do is, is make sure that you know what you're doing is out of faith and not from fear. And that you know, and, and you're as convicted as I am, that this is what you're supposed to do for Christ, and this is what God wants you to do. And that's what I'm trying to get at here tonight, is to make sure that I don't want, I don't want anybody, anybody to have their conscience seared from this whole event and think that I did the wrong thing. But I'm telling you that is what you're doing, ask yourself this question, is what you're doing a Hall of Faith material? Are you risking your life for Christ? Are you willing to? Are you willing to give your all? I mean, come on, right now, we're not risking much. There's not a ton, but if we give up right now, I feel like in the future, maybe even the next generation, they're going to have to fight for their faith. And I don't, want, I don't want my kids, and I don't want my grandkids having to get out there and fight for their faith. No, I want to pass it down to them, and I want to teach them about it. And I want them to know of their grandfather's faith and their dad's faith. And I want them to pass it down so they don't have to fight for it, so we don't have to go through these times again, through these wars and... And there are these times where we're having to stand up for our faith and we have to be great men of faith and we have to risk our lives for it. I want to be able to, be, be able to pass something down to the next generation that's solid and that they can stand on and they can keep going and they can protect it and they can pass it on to the next. I don't want to waver. I don't want to be known as the generation that wavered and they dropped the ball for the next one. And I'm telling you folks that you know, just get alone with God and let him convict your heart about this. Let him, let him speak to you personally of what you should do about this whole situation. Because you know what? More, more, I guarantee him that will probably lean more to we need to get back in church. We need to get back into serving God. And, and it's all well and good about going to these rallies to free California. I've, I've been to one, and, and that's great. 
But if we really want to free California, then we need to rally to the church. And we need to be in God's church. Christ sent his son to die for it. Don't forsake it so, so flippantly without a second thought. Think about it. Pray about it. And then God, let God convict you of it. So as the pianist comes, we're going to have an invitation. And if, if God has spoken to your heart about this, I just encourage you just, just get alone and spend some time with the Lord. And just let Him work in your heart. The Lord's been just doing such a work in my own heart about this whole thing. And I just encourage you to do the same. Just, just let God work in your heart. And, and all we can do is, is just do what we believe God is calling us to do during these times. And that's all we can do during hard times is have faith in God. Don't trade your faith for fear. Don't trade your faith for peace. Anytime you trade your faith, that's a bad trade. So as the pianist plays, we have the invitation, just do business with God.